Uh, we live in a time of profound change, and really what better place to be than uh, a place like this, uh, a place like the oral history program. Because oral history is not just about documenting or digging up or dredging up history, uh, it's about documenting the moment that we're living in. Even before World War II, you had what we today would label embryonic beginnings oral history. And you even had some taping. The Smithsonian Institution, for instance, had taped some of the music of some of the Western Indians, for instance. And um, of course, on tape recorders that we would consider very archaic today, wire recorders and things like that. But it was not until after World War II when a lot of the taping apparatus became more available. And a program starts at Columbia University, and it's very successful. It went to the shakers and makers of history, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, for instance, Herbert Hoover, people like that were being interviewed. And of course, everybody took pride in the fact that now you not only had their memories, but you also had their voices. Well, I guess the one person that was so influential was Studs Terkel, and particularly um, his book on World War II and Division Street. Um, I thought he did a fine job, again, of getting the mood of the time and the thoughts of the people. Interview, again, enough people from different walks of life. I, I think that gives you, again, this, this broad overview. So I think in some ways he popularized it. As oral history begins, as you know, at Columbia University in 1948. It had been thought about a long time and some activity, which you might call oral history, although it wasn't, had been involved. In the 1930s, for instance, one of the WPA projects was the Florida Writers Project and interviews were gathered here. They weren't taped interviews, but they were gathered, they were interviews. People like Zora Neale Hurston, for instance, went out and interviewed individuals and wrote down the answers. By the middle of the 1960s, there were about 60 oral history projects, most of them relatively small, but some larger like Berkeley, uh, in existence in the United States. And we were not yet involved in the thing. And they had a meeting at Lake Arrowhead, California, to decide if there was a future for oral history, and if so, what was that future going to be? Was it going to be history? Was it going to be anthropology? Was it going to be archives? Was it going to be library? What? So when the invitation or notice came to Margaret Goggin, who was then the librarian and a good friend, and I had this office in the library, the archives office, Margaret said to me, why don't you go to this meeting? I'll pay your way and see where it stands if this is something the University of Florida wants to become involved in. So I did, I went to New York. We met at the Columbia House in New York City. We went by bus up to Asilomar. It was an unbelievable meeting. Frank Friedel was there, Commenter was there, uh, Alfred Knopf was there. You name who had, who, the, the, leading, the leading people in that area were there. I'd never been to a meeting where I found more first-rate people like that all assembled under one roof. And out of it came the organization of the Oral History Association. I came back to Gainesville, all enthusiastic, and Margaret said, well, let's give it a try. Well, I had an office then in Library West, and we had a typewriter. We had a four-drawer filing cabinet. I had a student assistant then. I think we were paying 35 cents an hour for it at that time. And we became an oral history, developed an oral history program. And the biggest coup he had is he got a Doris Duke grant to do interviews with Southeastern Indians. And that's a huge, 
very valuable collection, and those interviews are priceless. Uh, nobody had done that, particularly with the Seminoles, who, as you know, uh, don't even really have much of an oral tradition in terms of their history. They do in terms of their culture. The big leap was when we became in, involved in the Dara Duke support. And so I think that was a step he took that brought the program to a different level of achievement and recognition around the country. Got a telephone call one day from this man from the University of Utah identified himself and he said, I understand you have an oral history program at Florida. I said, yes, we do. I didn't tell him how penny ante it really was. And a library, yes, sir, that's interested in Indian history, yes, sir. He said, I'd like to come down and talk to you and some of your colleagues about an oral history project dealing with the Seminole Indians. And since he was paying his own way, I said, come on. So John Mayen was the chairman of history and uh, Charles Fairbanks were the, was the chairman of anthropology. And there were a couple of anthropology students who were working on the Florida Indians. So we all got ready for the visit and he came and um, we entertained him very nicely, took him to lunch and you know, showed him around the campus and the library and all of those things. He was here for two days, I think, and uh, left and went back. He said to me, he said, why don't you prepare a budget of if you were gonna start an oral history program, we want a one year program with the Florida Seminoles. Prepare a budget. Well, John Mayen and I had never had a penny up until that time. I'd had a homemade tape recorder. So we put down a lot of things, a lot of things. It came to about $40,000. And we sent it out to Utah and didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. I thought what he did is got in and threw it in the garbage can. And then the phone rang and it was he. He said, I got your... Proctor, I got your budget. He said, it's not worth a damn. I said, what's wrong? He said, you're in North Florida and the Seminoles are in South Florida in Hollywood. How are you going to get down there? He said, you need transportation, don't you? And do you have a telephone? Anyway, he said, I've approved the budget, but I increased it to $60,000. <laughs> so that's really what put us on the map. Before it was all over, we got about $240,000 from the Doris Duke. And we got about 900 interviews. And we really reclaimed or recovered a lot of history that otherwise would have been lost. Um, many of these Indians did not know very much about their own history. And in this interrogation that we were doing, a lot of it came to the surface. So all of the tapes have been transcribed. They've been used for a variety of purposes over the years. Uh, just recently, I have used the interviews with the Seminole Indians and have worked with Harry Kersey. We just finished a book uh, on the Seminole Indians. They've been very successful. So it was money that was wisely spent. Uh, and so by going and talking to them and uh, Tom King, who was working here at the time, he went and lived with them for a year. Dr. Pleasance, when you when you first arrived at the University of Florida, Samuel Proctor was directing the Oral Street program. Can you talk about your your reflections and your interactions with Professor Proctor? Sam was um, a very influential member of the Department of History, but more so he was an individual who was heavily involved in university activities. He had just started, he started in 1967, the oral history program here. I came in 1969, so he had just started. We got teaching resources to, to build us a recording set. We didn't have any money to buy a recorder. Now his beginning was essentially interviewing people at the university. That was the thrust of his 
time in oral history. And the first interview I did, as I think I've told you, was with, Mar with Marna Brady, who was the first dean of women on campus. He had come here upon the invitation of Dr. Uh, Miller. He had met her at uh, Columbia when she got out of the Marine Corps. She was working on a PhD there. And so Marna was our cross street neighbor and a good friend. And she agreed to do the interview. So the first interview I did was with her. And maybe I told you the story. We did it in our backyard, which turned out not to be a wise thing because later on we heard the sound of animal, I mean of bugs going through and so on. We didn't realize how sensitive the microphones would be. I think we're not quite sure what the reaction of all of this is going to be. But we are beginning to record an oral interview with Marna B. Brady, former Dean of Women here at the University of Florida, and now Professor of Logic in the University College. And first, I think, Marna, I'm going to ask you if you will give us some of the your own biographical background. Oh, educational or other? Well, give us some of your earlier background, and I'll take the educational and then sort of your employment program. Where are you from? Well, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. You were born in Cincinnati? Born in Cincinnati. And uh, my grandfather was a writer and a teacher there <clears throat> on my mother's side. But the fact that it was a very good interview, she answered all of my questions, very cooperative. She goes home, and I started to play the interview, and I got nothing but a blank. And so I was very upset about it, and I thought there was something wrong with the, uh, with the tape recorder that they had made on campus. So I took the tape to the campus on Monday and played it on a real tape recorder, and I still got a blank. And then I realized that I'd forgotten to hit the record button. So I'd gone through two and a half hours of recording without ever recording anything. I explained to Marna that the machine had malfunctioned. But we redid the interview, and it was as good the second time as it was the first time. And so that started us on the oral history project. Tell me a little bit about other uh, significant projects within the oral history uh, program, topic-wise. Well, you started the biggest with one... The biggest thing, I think, was the university history, uh, all of which, well, I would say about 90% of them I did. Others have done others since then. We did about 400 interviews, and I tried to spread it so that I got a broader picture. For instance, I did a, a number of the librarians to get a history of the library. I did a series of interviews with all of the chairs of the history department. We did interviews with people in the various sciences. We did a whole string and continue to do interviews with people who are connected with the medical center, starting right from the very beginning with the original faculty. So I tried to spread it around the campus. And then we have a lot of interviews that were done prior to my arrival. Um, uh, African-American midwives, uh, Florida Highway Patrol, on and on and on. So, I mean, now we have over 4,000 interviews and probably, I don't know, 120,000 pages of transcripts. We did, of course, many different projects, small, medium-sized, some large. One of the ones I remember was the history of the Jewish community of West Palm Beach. And, of course, those transcripts are in our collection today. Um, one of the things I mentioned briefly that I thought was absolutely fascinating was a series of interviews with federal judges. Um, and some of these judges are really important. Um, at least one was a potential Supreme Court nominee. As I say, over the years, remember we started in 1967, and our first interview, the one with Marna Brady, was 1969. Now we have, according to Julian's count, about 3,800 interviews in the collection. It's the largest oral history archives in the South, and really one of the major ones in the United States. 
Two other things that I think were important is a series of interviews with the Water Management District. Uh, water is going to be, in some ways, a crucial issue in this state. We did um, interviews on the Jewish community of Jacksonville using volunteers to work there, including my cousin, Doris Proctor. Uh, we did a, a really interesting series of interviews on the restoration of the Everglades and what had gone wrong. Very interesting projects, the Everglades restoration, for instance. And that tied into a series of interviews we also did uh, about the environment and about growth management. And we've talked to a lot of people influential in the state about how to deal with this growth and, and what is the responsibility of the state, how can we control growth, how can we make sure there's enough water. Um, and so those were, I, I think, really important issues in this state. The contested presidential election in Florida are just some of the things that we're involved with. As my time allows me to, and I don't strain myself at all, but I've been gathering uh, interviews with top business leaders in Florida. I've recently done one the last month with Clark Butler from Butler Plaza here, and he tells a very interesting story. Out in Pensacola in early July, I did one with Fred Levin, the guy who gave the money for the law school naming. And I've got another one scheduled later this month or early next month with Luther Coggin in Jacksonville, the automobile magnet. Uh, and I'm going to set one up with Bill Emerson, the alumni who was uh, into stocks and investments in the Atlanta area for many years. And I'm also doing things dealing with the history of the medical center. Uh, what was your, uh, what has been so far up, up to this point, your favorite most memorable interview? It, it would be, without question, Pete Peterson, who was this POW for six and a half years. And I interviewed him at the State Department. He had just been appointed the first American ambassador to Vietnam. His new office was about six blocks from the Hanoi Hilton, where he had been tortured all those years. And I thought it was pretty remarkable <laughs> that a guy who had been tortured and it was extraordinary how he withstood this torture for six and a half years. I mean, that is a, an unbelievable amount of time to survive. And so the interview was done with him and it was absolutely matter of fact. And he talked about being shot down and being tortured and how he was tortured and how they fought back and they... They had a tap code so they could interact with other people. He talked about being in prison with John McCain. And the question I asked him was, you know, how do you survive six and a half years? I mean, how do you mentally and physically survive all these beatings and all these torture? And he said, I really don't know. And then he started explaining it in a way. He said, well, I'm a Catholic. I have great faith. I'm a patriot. I was well-trained. I was in good physical condition. Um, I was 10th uh, of 12 kids. I sort of learned to fend, fend for myself. And he said, ultimately, it was a mindset that he was not going to give in. And all of this was matter of fact, without any emotion at all, until he talked about coming back to the United States the first time he saw the American flag. That got him. There's a little emotional shift at that moment, and I said, do you have any regrets? None whatsoever. And I said, how could you go back and be an ambassador to people who are tortured? He said, once I left the camp, I left all animosity and anger behind. I said, it was done. You can't live your life hating people. And he said, I thought it was such a great opportunity to go back and heal these relationships between this country and the United States. Through the uh, cooperation of Jean Chalmers, who was then on the city commission and later mayor of Gainesville, she was able to get us money, I think about $15,000, if I remember correctly, to do a project on the blacks of Gainesville. 
and that was a very effective one. We were able to contact a local man by the name of Joel Buchanan, and Joel, and he did it on a volunteer basis, but he knew everybody, and he got along particularly with elderly, elderly blacks, and what we were trying to get was teachers and preachers and people who had been in business along Northwest Fifth Avenue, kind of a middle class. And Joel was just perfect for that, and he enjoyed doing it. So that was a very effective project that we did. The 27th, 1981, I'm Joel Buchanan, taping Mrs. Wilhelmina William Johnson at her home, H24 Northwest 7th Avenue in her living room. This tape is for the Oral History Project, University of Florida. Dr. Pleasance, what are your hopes for the future of the program? Well, I think we have at this juncture a solid foundation. As we mentioned earlier, the new facilities are wonderful. That will help us. The relationship with the new Graham Center will be very productive. We've got a dynamic, new, capable director coming in. We've got, I think, strong support from the history department. And we have had strong support from the college. And I think that this program can be one of the four or five best programs in the country. I don't think we'll ever get to where Columbia is, but I think the potential here is great. We're in Julian Pleasance, who now directs the oral history program here at the University of Florida, who took over from me and who's doing an excellent job. Uh, he's not overwhelmed, but he's being approached very often to do projects. Uh, and we're constantly being called on the telephone by people who know somebody who has this wonderful story to tell who's living down in Tavares or in Panama City. As the way you describe oral history, it sounds to me that oral history helps us understand really what it means to be fully human. Yes, very good. Absolutely. And you get that in different context as you go. Politicians and judges <laughs> and water management people have a different view of the world, but all of them have this universal view <laughs> of humankind. And the water management people, they see water as this precious commodity that we need to survive. And they understand how important it is, and politicians in their own way do. Everybody sort of looks at it in that, and, and the Seminole Indians who who see the world in a vastly different point of view than the rest of us, but the humanity, that element, and they talk about family and history and culture and pride of being a Seminole, all of that comes together with, with the way you express it. I think it is part of the mass humanity, and that's why oral history is fascinating, to interview all these people at different levels, to different positions, different experiences. Here I am, it's 2002, late in 2002. I've got a digital video camera and lavalier microphones and I've set up lights and my camera's on a tripod. We didn't dream of all of that back in the 1960s and 1970s. I carried a tape recorder that, as I say, we bought from Radio Shack and we're glad to get the $60 to buy it. We had some tapes and we had a yellow pad and a pencil, and that was our equipment. And as I say, to begin with, we made a lot of mistakes. My interview with Marna Brady, for instance, was in my backyard. And you get them all together, and it does give you this broad cross-section of humanity. It really does, and it, I think that's what, I, what appeals to me more is the, is the human element as opposed to somebody explain to me uh, how they're going to improve uh, the oxygen content of water. I mean, that that's too technical. The issues that are relevant for me are these, these more human issues and, and emotions and commitment to uh, country or job or family or whatever it might be. 
And that, that's what makes it come alive. That's where the drama is. I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy doing it. And I look forward to continue doing it over the years. I think that this program can be one of the four or five best programs in the country. I see a very bright future, of course. I want to invite each and every one of you to uh, become a part of what we're doing, to become a part of building Samuel Proctor's legacy. And we honor Sam because we understood, uh, we understand that he set for all of us a peerless example of scholarship, teaching, and service and commitment to the people of Florida. And there are many ways to honor his, his legacy. Uh, and I would submit to you that one of these is to become actively involved in programming um, and work at the Proctor Oral History Program. And we're always looking for ideas, for feedback, for volunteers. So I invite you to, to check us out. Anyway, that's the story. You touch the lives, and the lives touch you in many ways. Uh, I think we still have much to learn from Sam Proctor, and I think we should all dedicate ourselves to building on his rich legacy in Florida. Thank you. <laughs>